All right, uh, welcome class uh, to today's session. And uh, I think we're on uh, session four now. And session four actually looks at the price and financial services. That is, how do we price uh, financial services? As we all know, uh, when it comes to the four P's in marketing, pricing is the only P that actually brings you know, uh, kind of a revenue to the company. You would say that the rest of them are all cost items because it's uh, some things that you actually spend on uh, with regards to marketing you know, the rest of the piece. But however, pricing is the one that actually brings in the revenue, brings in the money. After we spend so much, we have to actually price the goods or the services or the product in a way that we can actually generate some revenue as a going concern. So I think it's one of the very, very important, you know, element in the marketing mix. And we're going to look at the various pricing mechanisms or various pricing strategies that businesses, especially financial services, actually use in order to remain relevant in the market. We would also look at the pricing objectives, you know, because you just don't set the price. You set the price based on the objective that you have you know, for the business. Is it that you want to expand your market share? Is it that you want to you know, kind of uh, grow the profit? Or is it that you want to break even? Is it that you want to use the price as a competitive you know, kind of signal? We all look at, you know, we're going to look at these you know, factors and how they actually, you know, financial services actually use them. So in this session, like I said, the session overview is the pricing is one of the most important elements in the marketing mix, not only because of its character as the sole source of revenue, but also it's the other relevance to financial services, such as competition and sign of quality. Now, in pricing, companies make strategic intent statements such as increasing market share or aiming towards profitability, as I said earlier. So let's... As usual, uh, the session outline, uh, we will look at tripod of cost underpinning pricing. That is, uh, what are some of the cost factors that we take into consideration you know, when we actually price pricing. And then again, complexities of financial services pricing. Yeah, we'll look at how difficult it is and how complex it is, you know, setting up financial prices, uh, pricing, taking into consideration other factors like the regulator, like the competition, I mean, the demand curve and everything else. Challenges in pricing and financial services, we look at the role of price in financial services and the objectives. Reading list as usual. Right, so when we say the tripod of cost that underpin financial you know, pricing or pricing of financial services, we mean that before you price, obviously we look at what is in there that the customer is actually buying and what is in there that the supplier or the service provider is actually offering. So we look at that particular you know, uh, uh, factor in pricing financial services. We're also looking at the competition. How much is competition offering the customer in terms of you know, the, the service and what you know, does the customer actually see as value from the competitor's offering? And we also look at the demand curve Obviously, we say that the wealthier the population, the greater the demand for financial services. And in previous sessions, we've seen how diverse the demand for financial services has become as a result of the increasing growth of the SME market, the increasing, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, aspirations or increasing ambition of people wanting to set up their own businesses, you know, from small scale up to medium up to the, you know, the large scale. So we have seen how increasingly the, 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 the market or the, 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 the economy is actually growing, then there's a diverse for you know, financial product in terms of demand. So we look at that. Now, when we say pricing in, in, in financial services, what do you think it is? Or what do we think it is? Obviously, pricing, for example, could be a monthly fees for a check account, i.e. every month you have a check account, you've got to actually pay a particular fee towards servicing that. Or you have a savings account, every month you pay a particular token 
to towards servicing it you know by the bank again we can look at it as a life a term life insurance policy for example you know uh, in an insurance company we can look at it as a financial services advising session maybe you've gone in to see your personal like a, a personal financial you know a manager for a particular advice on you know financial product or on a particular transfer or whatever now and they decide to charge you a little bit you know, for that consultation of course that could be a financial you know price again we have a interest rate and then we have a you know interest rate on savings account as i earlier on said now if we look at the complexities of financial services we can see that it's diverse i mean like i said earlier we have so many you know financial product be it mortgage be it credit card be it loans be it uh, stocks you know so many and all of them have a different i mean peculiarity in terms of pricing them and if you look at for example auto lease now we considering the pricing for auto lease means that we've got to consider how much in total you know that auto you know lease will cost you know the the customer but of course when considering that you're looking at certain many many you know factors to take into consideration in terms of how could the person actually meet that particular demand you know or how could actually the customer be able to you know satisfy or be able to pay off that particular you know cost so for example if we consider an auto lease we may consider the monthly payment spread over a number of months and then you know vis-a-vis -vis either want uh, the person want to pay you know or want to make it a down payment so for example you can say that 269 ghana cities a month spread over i mean 269 ghana cities a month you know for 35 months you know which means if you multiply by uh, 269 Ghana cities, you know, by 35 months, that tells you you know, the total that the person is actually paying. But because you're actually paying it monthly, that becomes there, you know, than when you're making a down payment, obviously, as a result of possible inflation, possible interest rates, you know, changes and things like that. So you may consider, you know, how long is the person going to pay it for? What's the, you know, monthly payment? Or if it's a weekly payment, What's the figure for weekly payment? What's the difference between that and then a down payment of a, a lump sum? So we take all this into consideration. For example, home insurance, again, again, you have to consider the premium. How much is the person actually paying, you know, the entire, you know, uh, worker insurance and how much is supposed to be paid every month spread over how long? Now, you may also want to consider the dwelling coverage personal property coverage, payment cycles, living expenses, liability coverage, guest medical expenses, and then discount allowed. All these factors you may have to take into consideration you know, when you're actually pricing home insurance. Same as mortgage, you look at the interest rate, point charge at closing, lock-in period, and then you want to look at when people actually you know, at default, you know, what's the default penalty rate, and all those things you've got to consider. Same as a check account, we've talked about it earlier on. You know, your monthly fee that you pay towards the service in that particular account. So we can see that there are various factors that you have to take into consideration when pricing in any of these financial services. And then if we look at the challenges, for example, because we have a financial service as a multifaceted, you know, kind of a... Uh, uh, what you call service or multifaceted as a kind of product because you have for example if you have a life insurance you want to look at the coverage amount exclusions you know what would actually make somebody not qualify you know you look at length of policy and then you look at the premium all these factors we've actually talked about earlier again how do you quantify the cost you know of a particular you know uh, financial services you know, how do you quantify, you know, risks and all these are actually, you know, a challenge, you know, in, in pricing financial services. So we say the quantifying cost may be very difficult in financial services. We also have you know, uh, quantifying profits associated with a given client 
difficult due to bundled relationships. So you may have a client requesting for X and Y product. Again, how do you, you know, arrive at cost for that particular you know, client? And then we have a determination of quality. And we say that when it comes to financial services, quality determination of what is quality could be elusive. And of course, if you're actually pricing according to quality, according to you know, what the brand actually stands to give the customer, again, how do you determine how much somebody pay for that quality dimension? So all these are some of the challenges that we have when we actually, you know, pricing financial services, not to even talk about the regulatory. You know, we have a regulatory framework or the regulators, you know, kind of uh, directives that financial services have to work within. Now, if the regulator says that the base price is actually this figure, now, obviously, each and every competitor would have to work within that base price and, of course, you know, consider their own cost within the company. So... The difficulty is how do you actually work, you know, both ways? How do you actually take these into consideration? The regulators, you know, kind of directives and the companies and operations vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the competition and how much the customer wants to actually pay for the service. So these are some of the challenges that we actually deal with. Then, of course, another challenge that we I haven't actually talked about is potential channel conflict. You know, for example, when you deal with, you know, uh, insurance, for example, you have brokers or the brokerage having it on objectives, and then the the originators or the the source of the service itself, that is the insurance company, also having its own objectives, financial objectives, you know, or pricing objectives. Now, how do you marry both to make sure that you are offering value to the customer? Also, another big challenge. So we have said that the role of price in financial services or the role of price in marketing actually is the sole kind of uh, uh, the sole source of revenue you know because that's what actually gives us money to manage the business going forward but then also it signals competition because the kind of price that actually you come out with would actually either set the bar from you know set the bar you know higher that other competitors may not necessarily be able to what, enter the market or could set the bar lower for other competitors to, to be able to, what, to enter the market. So the pricing or for customers to be able to you know, acquire a particular you know, product. So the pricing is actually crucial as a revenue aggregated and at the same time as a competition signal. Again, we said that the pricing also signal quality because if the brand is of value and you want to actually communicate that this brand is not as any other brand as you know in the market. Pricing is one of the strategies that you use to actually signal that quality. So you see most exclusive products actually are not, you know, the kind of pricing that the market detect. You know, obviously they set up the price in consideration with the cost, but crucially what the brand actually seeks to offer the customer and how much value the customer thinks that they're gaining from the brand would actually allow the brand to actually set up higher prices, what we call scheme prices. So that is also another role or function of the price as a signal of quality. The pricing objectives, like I said earlier, you've got to have your pricing objectives. You couldn't actually stand up and say, okay, my cost is X and Y. As a result, I will sell it at this price. You must have an objective behind the pricing strategy. Is the objective to penetrate the market? Is the objective to develop new market? Is the objective, you know, to sort of uh, cut down on competition or to cut competition, the competitors off? All these should be the objective, you know, of the business uh, for the pricing, the kind of pricing that they're setting up. Is the objective to sort of, um, you know, uh, achieve profitability and all those things you have to actually set up. So we're saying that, for example, if we want to increase market share, the pricing objective or the price would, should be perhaps you know, uh, lesser you know, than the competition. So P is less than the competition, that is what competition is offering. If it's about profit generation, then P is greater than the cost. 
that is the price is greater than the cost now if it's about profit maximization i.e yes you're actually generating profit but you are maximizing profit then of course the p which is the price would should be or should be based on the perceived customer value and the demand function so how much value do customers think you're offering them and at what cost are they prepared to pay Now, we have various pricing methods you know, in, in financial services, just like we have in other marketing, you know, you know, uh, what do you call, in other markets. Now, we have a regulation-based pricing, we have cost-based pricing, parity pricing, value-based pricing. And like we said, the regulation is where you have the regulator, and especially when it comes to financial services, it is one of the industries or sectors that is highly regulated. So the industry in the regulator actually come out with a base price within which all players must work. And obviously that price could be the base, but then also they would have a, a ceiling in, at which no one can actually go beyond it. So every competitor must actually work within that particular regulator's price. And of course, cost-based pricing is about what determining your cost elements and adding some kind of margin you know, towards that. So let's see. So you have regulators, you know, set prices to be charged or ceiling levels so the companies don't actually go over that. Financial services provider primarily function as a distributor, not necessarily as a price setter. So like I said, the price setter is the regulator, how much you're supposed to pay for, let's say, your uh, casualty insurance or your motor insurance. The regulator will set the, the base price and then the ceiling perhaps, so that companies could naturally go beyond that to take advantage of consumers. Then you have, uh, example, flood insurance, reverse mortgage fees, etc., as we have actually you know, explained. The cost base, like I said, is about what? The transaction, the cost of transactions, services used as lower bound for prices. So you determine your cost and then you mark up you know, a percentage on the cost based on the business objectives. Remember, we said that the pricing has to have an objective for it. So you, you have the price equals cost multiplied by, you know, uh, what do you call your, your markup. How do you estimate cost? So we have example in financial services. Let's say you have 100,000 active accounts. You know, that is 100,000 people you know, as your customer base. Now, average monthly transaction cost per account is one city, for example. Now, overhead and fixed cost of the branch would be, or is, uh, what do you call, 400,000 per month. So you know that your fixed cost and overhead cost for that particular branch is 400,000 a month. So your cost is actually your fixed cost plus overhead cost. So total cost will be the one city multiplied by the number of accounts that you have in your books plus your 400,000 you know, cities overhead, uh, uh, what do you call, cost per, the, per month. So that would be 500,000 a month. That would be your total cost. So for you to have an average cost, that is how much each client is supposed to bear or how much you're supposed to attribute to each customer then you're gonna have it as 500,000 divided by the 100,000 customers that you have, and that will give you what uh, your average cost per month. So in this case, the average cost becomes what? Five Ghana cities per month. So as you can see the illustration, you have 100,000 active account, average monthly transaction cost per account is one, you know, one city, Overhead and face cost of a branch, for example, is about, let's say, 400,000 you know, a month. So your total cost is your transaction multiplied by the number of clients that you have plus the face cost that we determine as 400,000. So that will give you 500,000 per month, and then you divide it by the 100,000 accounts that you have. So per month, you're going to have five cities per head. Now, once you've determined that cost, then you've got to add your, what, your profit, which is the, the markup. So you say the 60% markup on that five cities 
will give you what eight you know uh ghana cities then of course when you minus your cost which is the five cities out of it we're saying that your profit becomes what three cities so that is how you determine you know your cost and then your profit after you've actually added your markup and then multiplied your cost you know from it now limitations of cost-based pricing in financial services obviously when you actually set your pricing on cost base you could actually you know underprice yourself you could actually you know kind of discourage demand or you could actually you know uh, kind of encourage competition because all that you're doing is that you're not taking into consideration other value values that could actually enhance your profitability so it is it is not you know recommended as a you know as a pricing strategy especially for uh, you know high end you know uh, what you call brands brands that are valuable you know cost based pricing is not recommended for high end brands for example i mean if you look at a, the limitations is allocation of fixed cost across multiple se services is difficult and sometimes impossible do you equally allocate fixed cost so if we have a fixed cost of 500,000 within let's say three departments how do you allocate the cost to these three departments do you actually share them equally or do you determine their level of activities and then determine how much cost you've got to allocate to individuals uh, uh, department so it makes it difficult and then again even when it comes to the client you know how much do you allocate to the clients that you have obviously certain clients may be using the services much more than others do you have to equally you know kind of you know allocate cost to them you know so that's a uh, one one challenge then fixed demand for services assumed to exist at all price levels now if you look at it we assume that at any price level i mean the first cost is is the same but it couldn't actually be the case you know so we assume that the demand you know at whatever price level that we actually you know uh, set our prices we're gonna assume we're gonna get the same demand levels but we know that there are other times that demand may actually go high or lower in terms of let's say seasonalities you know so high uh, i mean peak season will call for a different in you know, a type of demand low season will call for a different type of demand and we should know that price i mean you know it says we, we, with this particular costing no price elasticity is assumed we assume that the demand level will be the same because you know the demand would not be you know uh, it, it would not be sensitive to price but we know that it doesn't actually work that way cost can be volatile for example in property and casualty insurance price increase when interest rates fall due to lower interest revenue from investment obviously insurance companies actually use premiums to invest and as a result once they invest and they get money you know the the pricing for insurance product like property and casualty may may actually go down but of course when the interest rate fall then of course you expect to pay higher for your property and casualty insurance so again cost based may be a little bit deceptive in that order so that's the the demand curve you know for uh, pricing like we said cost concentration financial services total fixed cost you know we say the number of customers number of customers you know doesn't matter you know the number of customers that you have you know the cost the total fixed cost will remain the same and then again you know similar you know kind of diagrams here but is likely to increase a little bit in terms of the cost aspect you know when customers actually you know the 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 number of customers that you get travel to some point because you may have to embark on some kind of expansion project you know to to kind of uh, accommodate the kind of customers that you're actually getting in so at some point you know fiscal the curve would change as a result of the number of customers that you're getting in because obviously if the banking hall for example can you know kind of uh, contain x number of customers at some point of your you know uh, acquisitions 
you may you know consider making some adjustment here and there and that can actually you know influence you know the fixed cost um, factor and then again we say cost consideration in financial services again average cost certainly will be impacted upon or would be influenced upon you know when there is an increase in customers you know or acquisitions why because you're actually spreading the cost over how many clients or how many customers you have so obviously the lower the customers the higher the average cost the more customers you get the lower the average cost as you can see you know depicted in the diagram so hence customers base customer base expansion results in lowering of average cost higher profit etc yeah we also see the example with 100,000 clients, the profit is caused 100,000 client, you know, uh, into bracket 8 minus 5, that, that is the, our profit region, which is, you know, 3, remember? So you multiply the 3 by the 100,000, you get 300,000 as your profit. You know, with 200,000 clients, again, you have your average cost reducing as a result of what? The, uh, what do you call, the fact that you have actually increased clientele levels but of course you enhance your profit because you still having you know the cost of the product at the same you know uh, uh, what do you call price so you actually spread you reduce your average cost you know but then you gain more profit so you have about what eight hundred thousand as your profit so two times increase in the number of clients increases profit by almost three times that is 300k leading to 800k now the next pricing uh, uh, method or pricing strategy is parity pricing now parity pricing is about you know actually setting your prices according to the competition how much you know is the competition or how what is the competition offering the customer and you actually setting yourself against that particular benchmark in order to you know kind of either win customers from the competition or prevent customers from going to competition so parity pricing is also another method that we have in financial you know services now obviously it says your price equals a factor multiplied by a key competitor's price so who is your key competitor you have to establish that and how much do they charge so say that we have five you know players in the industry including ourselves so you have competitor A, who is the leader in the market with 47% share, and you're pricing currently at 938. Competitor B, the next in the market, is has it has a 21% share, and you know they're pricing at 852. Competitor C, which is ourselves, we have 7% share in the market. 861 is our current price and competitor D 5% share competitor E 3% share so when we actually looking at parity price you're looking at which of these do we want to you know kind of make inroads into their customers do we want to target competitor A in order that we can you know kind of break into the uh, you know in the market share break into the customers to attract some of the customers or do you want to set ourselves against competitor b so that decision has to be made so for example we decide that okay let's go for a you know competitor b for example so for the following year we say the yearly cost of auto insurance for 30 year old female driving a 30,000 you know car for example so the firm which is the firms that we have actually outlined that is firm a b c d and E and remember we are the C. So the market share, obviously ours is seven percent, the top two twenty one and forty seven. And remember we're targeting competitor B. Now, if competitor B is currently pricing at seven nine five, you know, no for 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 the coming year. Obviously the previous year was eight five two, but coming year their revised price is seven nine five. Now, what we're doing is that we're actually using them as a benchmark in order to price our current, you know, price. 
our revised price using A as a key competitor will be our 861 divided by their 938. Remember, remember that was the last year pricing. So our last year price was 861 divided by their, that is competitor A's last year price, which is 938. Multiply by their current revised price, which is 887. That will give us 814. So 814 becomes our current price. Our current price. Because we're actually matching competitor A's you know, uh, pricing for this year. So it will be our last year's pricing divided by their last year pricing multiplied by their current pricing. And that will give you our current price. If we parity price against competitor B, the same method, it will be our 861 last year pricing divided by their 852 last year pricing multiplied by their 795 current pricing. And that will give us 84804. So if we're parity pricing against competitor A, our price will be 814. If we're parity pricing against competitor B, our pricing will be 804. So which means that in both ways, we're able to break into the market because we actually price lower than what they have. Now the question is, are customers going to actually sway to us as a result of the lower pricing in comparison to these two competitors? Well, it could be yes, or it could be no, depending on what value they think the competitors are actually offering. Remember, sometimes, especially when it comes to quality, price or cost demand may be insensitive to price because of the value that they are, being, they are getting or they are being given. So it depends on how the market is structured. Are these competitors offering values or offering values that are actually higher than customers' expectations? If they are doing so, then of course it is most likely that we may not be able to do what? Win customers from them. And then again, it depends on what type of customer class. Obviously, you do a segmentation and you look at which of the customers are we targeting. If we're actually targeting the lower end of their customers, perhaps, yes, we'll be able to do what? To make inroads with the price changes. The limitation in parity pricing is that you can set off price wars. And if you don't have the financial muscle to fight the price wars, it will be very, very disadvantaged to your business and to the objectives of the business. So we have to be careful how we do or we use parity pricing. Again, it is not the best recommended in a pricing strategy, especially when we are talking about high-end value brands or distinctive, you know, distinct, you know, brands. You know, parity pricing may not be the best. The next one is the value-based pricing, which I think is the most recommended for uh, in a top brand or for companies who want to actually perceive to be perceived as what the leading brands. Now, value-based pricing is about you know taking into consideration customers' perception or perceived value about your brand, and then giving them the offering that you think or they the customers think that fall within that particular perception, and asking them to choose which offers, which attributes they think offer them value and how much they want to pay for that particular attribute. Of course, you have also considered, you know, your price, your cost elements, you know, before you set up the value, you know, uh, pricing. So, for example, possible sources of value. You look at your brand name of insurance provider. Now, what does a brand name do? It gives assurances, you know, because over time, the brand has performed, has delivered, and everybody knows that this brand is of higher quality. Now, what it does is that once you are actually with a particular brand, you save yourself most headaches of whether when you are involved in an accident, you're going to get a KTC car, you're going to get a, a, what do you call, legal assistance, you're going to get, you know, your prompt payments, you know, you're going to get all these values that actually comes with it. So the brand name itself is crucial. Now, how much do customers think that they want to pay for a brand name such as that? You know, it actually comes under the parity price. Convenient location of bank branch, for example. Again, are people happier 
to have convenience as a value. And if that is the case, what is that convenience? Access to internet, access to online banking, access to mobile banking, access to you know the check account, access to so many things. Now, once you're able to offer that particular convenience, how much do customers want to pay extra for that convenience? Again, is actually determined and the value, you know, pricing. So we've talked about the online access to credit card transaction information, for example, friendly customer services. So the price actually equals the base price of the product that is your you know, cost factors considered plus value of additional features of your service. So all these additional features that you, you give to customers, which of them do they determine as value and are prepared to pay extra towards it? Example. Average cost of auto insurance for 30-year-old female is 840 you know, cities, for example. Added value of our services, which is top ranking by third-party organization, 31 Ghana cities. Recognized brand, 15 Ghana, and that is ability to modify policy online, 25 Ghana. And mobile agents who come to your doorstep is 103 you know, cities. So the price itself is the 845 plus all the additions that we have actually calculated. Now, for you to come to a realization, for you to actually understand that, yes, customers will be happy paying this particular additions, you've got to use, for example, co-joint analysis as a way of determining, i.e., you list down or you line up all the attributes or the value attribute, and then you ask customers to choose which of these attributes they see as value and they are prepared to pay a little bit towards it, towards you know, having that particular value. Now, once they take those attributes, you actually look at all those responses and you come up with an attribute that best serves the needs of the entire customer base. And then you add it to the pricing as a way of you know, value pricing. So I think that is how you can actually do to gain insight into which value or which attribute customers see as value and are prepared to pay extra towards it. So I think that out of these pricing you know, matters that we have actually discussed, value pricing or value-based pricing is the best amongst them, especially for top-end brands, for leading brands who still want to maintain their position in the market. So sources of value in financial services as you can see, a list of value creators and value destroyers, you know, relevant loyalty programs would actually give you, you know, it's a value creator. It will let customers see your product as of value or your services as of value. Now, value destroyer is a high APR, you know, delayed increase in credit limits, junk mail inserted with statement, inaccessible customer services, all these destroy value. So if you want to make sure that you keep the value set, the bundle of values for your customers, do the middle one, never do the right one because they are value destroyers. All right, so now let's look at you know, credit products and what are they and um, you know, how, how we price them. Now, if you look at it, we have, essentially we have two, you know, um, or we have you know, about two, two types of credit product and within them we have subsets as well. For example, you have, um, we have a time frame, you know, a credit product, and we have collateralized or collateral uh, credit product. Now, time frame credit product, uh, we have revolving uh, versus non-revolving credit, revolving being credit cards and things that because they actually revolve, you know, over, over and over because you, you use the money, you use part of you go and pay in, you use part of you go and pay in. The non-revolving is just a one-off, you know, payment, you know, that you actually get in, and then you service that particular debt. Then we have the collateral, collateralized, you know, versus non-collateralized. Most of the time, you have, you know, uh, what we call the credit cards, for example, are non-collateralized, but mortgage, for example, could be collateralized or are collateralized. And so, for example, credit cards are revolving, but they are not. You know, collateralized home equity line of credit revolving collateralized home equity line alone non-revolving collateralized 
auto loans non-revolving collateralized home mortgage non-revolving collateralized project financing non-revolving collateralized commercial mortgages non-revolving collateralized pricing of credit that is considerations things that we consider in pricing you know of credit now obviously we look at a high rates you know that apply to non collateralized credit i mean obviously because it's non collateralized i.e you don't have any assets that are actually set against it just in case of default you know uh, the company would uh, would be able to use it to defray that so because of that the interest you know the rates will be higher than collateralized you know uh, kind of uh, product or credits so example credit cards versus auto loans and home mortgages you know so the first or the former credit cards are non collateralized and as a result will have higher interest of course auto loans and mortgages would be collateralized and as a result will have you know lower rates Now, we have various dimensions to price for credit. We have interest rate, we have penalties, we have processing fees, annual fees, collateral requirements. So, obviously, when you're actually pricing for uh, credit, you know, apart from the interest that we actually set, you know, or we gain as a price element, we also gain, you know, a revenue from uh, what you call uh, penalties, which is default, you know, uh, payment. So, if you default in paying a particular month, or in paying your bill or your, you know, uh, what you call uh, a facility, you have an amount of money, a percentage of it, you know, attracted or put on the, on on your on your payment, you know, as a as a punitive measure or as a penalty towards your default. And then of course, processing fees, you know, there's a little that companies charge, banks or financial institutions charge towards the management or the administration or the processing of the of the you know uh, service then annual fees etc now risk associated with the price of credit we know that there are quite a uh, few risks that we can actually think about performance risk i.e have we been able to examine or evaluate the customer to know that yes this customer would actually you know pay off the debt or would actually have the capacity to actually service the debt you know, so borrower does not pay or need to adjust rate based on what borrower's credit profile. So if you don't do the proper credit assessment, you're going to have a you know, problem in having people paying off their debt because they may not be able to pay and you haven't actually done the proper assessment from the beginning. Interest rate risk, obviously, we know the fluctuation, especially in Ghana, where you have the currency you know, not actually you know, stable you would have you know, issues with the interest rate. And whenever there's an adjustment, the organization or the company has to adjust accordingly. So we have that particular you know, risk as well. Tactical issues in pricing of consumer cr credit. Consumers typically ignore non-interest dimensions of credit, obviously. Usually, and as a, as a practice in financial services, usually you hear you know, the APRs being communicated clearly or the interest rate being communicated clearly to you. What you don't normally hear or what customers don't normally find out is about penalty fees, how much do you have to pay? Because there's always an assumption that they may not default. But of course, in one way or the other, customers default. So late payment penalties, you know, defaults, you know, delinquencies and things, you know, penalties, people don't actually get to find out. But it's one of the key critical decisions points that consumers may have to find out, suppliers may have to communicate as well. Total cost of transaction. Example, total lease payment may, be, may vary, may be very difficult for consumers to estimate. Sometimes consumers you know, have limitations about you know, some of these policies and may not be able to estimate the total cost. Obviously, one of the reasons is because, for example, you've spread it over 36 months or you've spread it, spread it over a number of months. Now, the monthly payment is easier, but then, or maybe easier, but then if you look at it in terms of the totality, then of course it may be very, very expensive. Of course, customers you know, may not have that capacity or that you know, expertise to work it out, and as a result, they, th they, they see it as the, the best alternative 
to the down payment, for example. Truth in Lending Act requires disclosure of the cost of credit to consumers. So it is incumbent on service providers to make sure that they actually communicate to com customers all the elements, the cost elements involved, i.e. the late penalty fees, you know, the, the kind of in interest that you're paying, you know, the kind of processing fees that goes with it, and every other cost element that a customer would end up paying, you know, but not necessarily seeing from the beginning, have to be communicated. So pricing savings products, obviously, apart from the insurance and the, you know, mortgage and things that we've looked at, we also have a savings, you know, product that you price. Obviously, your check account, savings account. We have two general approaches, you know, in pricing for these products and services, which is fees, explicit pricing fees that we pay, you know, towards maybe your credit card and the card, the debit card that you have or the card that you're using. And then, of course, you have the balances, which is an implicit price. And then your check, yeah, the checkbooks that you have, you know, you'll be paying uh, what you call fees on it. Now, balancing, example, free checking with minimum balance. So some banks would have, you know, check account, you know, but then the check account is actually tied into a particular minimum balance. So long as your balance actually, you know, go below that, then of course you start paying some service fees towards it. Others would have one standard service fees, you know, attracted regardless of the balance. So it depends on, you know, uh, uh, financial services, financial services. So average account has 5,000 in assets, annual interest earned by us or by the company due to our lending and investment activities is 10%. So you see, in the account, the customer has 5,000 in there, but the company is using it or the financial institution is using it for lending and it's getting 10%. Now we've charged the average account 10% by 5,000, which is 500 a year. So in actual fact, the money is sitting there, they're using the money, they're getting 10% out of it as a result of using it. Now, they will be paying you fees or they will be paying you interest on it, but obviously the interest would not be up to how much they are earning from that particular account. Then monthly fees, Again, is 10 maintenance plus 30 transaction fees. So you have uh, 500 a year, which is the percentage that they're getting as a result of using that money for the investment. And they're also getting well, maintenance and then transaction fees out of it as well. So these are two fees that they're getting from the same account. So fees versus balances. So a balance system may encourage customer acquisition and facilitate cross-selling. And then the balance system is highly interest rate sensitive. Obviously because as your, your balance is there and then you have a particular rate at which the bank is not actually charging you any fees. And it may actually attract you know, uh, what you call a lot of accounts or a lot of customers. But in actual fact, they're not charging any fees, but they're actually making interest on it. So pricing brokerage services. Now, when it comes to brokerage services, again, securities trading fees, you pay for that. Advisory service fees, you know, uh, early withdrawal penalties. That is, if you decide to withdraw your funds in mutual, you know, funds system, for example, you may end up paying early withdrawal penalties. And then asset management fees, again, the percentage applied to your value of assets that is in holding. Now, pricing life insurance also uh, we take into consideration the mortality table, for example, and usually you want to look at you know the total, the age you know uh, cohorts. Obviously, you have zero to eighty, for example, and then you have per per thousand, you know the life expectancy in you know, a rate per thousand customers, for example. So the figures that you have, you says, you know you have 4.2% uh, of your you know, thousand you know, cus uh, customers that are ages between, or well, ages zero, and then the rest of it. Then you have your life expectancy rate you know, between this. Obviously, as the person aged, 
you know, the life expectancy rate goes down. So you take into consideration the life expectancy in computing for a premium. So for example, 10,000, you know, term life policy for a 30-year-old male could be, you're assuming that 10,000 such policies are sold in a year. 17, 17 of these policies, of these 10,000 policyholders, will pass away this year. So you have 17 is equals 10,000 times what? 1.7 divided by 1,000. So 1.7 is up here, which is the percentage of the people within that age of uh, 30. And then you have, obviously, you know, uh, your thousand, you know, kind of uh, clients, customers. So you're saying that your expected payout will be 17, that is 17 people, multiplied by the 100,000, which is the premium of uh, the term life premium for the people within the age of 30 years. So that will give you 1.7 million. So you need to raise 1.7 million in order to make a, a, a payout to what? 17 people if they pass out or if they, if they die. So the premiums paid at the beginning of the year by the 10,000 clients should cover this amount in order to break even. So you have 10,000 multiplied by the premium equals 1.7 million or 1.7 million divided by the 10,000 you know, customers and that will give you the premium. So your premium equals 170 cities per year. You know, that is each customer is supposed to pay 170 cities and that would actually get you the 1.7. And that equals 14 cities per month. So if they are breaking it into monthly payment, then of course it will be 14 cities you know, per month. That is 170 divided by 12. The final determination of term life insurance policy price. Obviously, we look at the risk characteristics of the individual. Male death rate is greater than female death rate because of certain you know, lifestyles. Then smoking is not good for your health, for example, health history, the person's health history, what they've been involved in in the past. Their life, the entire lifestyle of the person is actually taken into consideration. Their age is taken into consideration. And then, of course, you know, gender. Investment returns, underwriting profits from premiums collected need to also be taken into account when computing the premiums. General consideration in pricing insurance product. Significant risk of adverse selection exists. And adverse selection, we're saying that you are not actually diligent enough to take into consideration all the factors, the risk factors that actually is associated with the client or with the customer. So as a result, you adversely select you know, policyholders that are high risk without knowing it. And then we have risk of moral hazard, i.e. people failing to disclose you know, certain you know, key you know, issues about them and about the policy. So individuals intentional withholding or provoking execution of the policy is a, is a, is a moral, moral hazard. And then life insurance outcomes are typically more predictable. Of course, I mean, death rates are predictable. How much you're going to pay for death rates are predictable than property and casualty insurance. And property and casualty insurance may be paid out years after the expiration of the policy in case of incidents established by courts to have taken place during the term of the policy. Obviously, if you know, somebody is able to prove beyond reasonable doubt in court that although the policy is actually expired, the incident actually took place at the time of the policy, then of course they will be forced or you'll be forced to make payment. So estimating the demand for financial services, that's the CAF. We're saying that whenever there's a volume, the price actually goes down. But of course that's subject to you know, specific, you know, financial product. There are some that the curve may not necessarily go down even when there is a high volume. If you look at it, the PNC insurance, for example, the property and casualty 
the, I mean, the relationship between volume and price is not that you know, fluid. You have others that actually quickly would actually respond to price, like credit cards, for example. The volume, you know, would lead to price you know, decreases. So estimating the shape of the demand function for financial services logic, present different groups of uh, present different groups of consumers with different prices and observe the effect on policy generation. Example. So if we actually target certain you know, customers with these differentials, you know, APRs of 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, and 4.5, to each group, and each group receives direct mail offers with an APR at one of these four price points, we may experience differences in the demand. So we're saying that we send 2,000 customers, you know, with these direct mails, and that customer group, we had an APR of 1.5. Now, we received 35 out of that 2,000 mails that we sent, which makes it 1.7%. If we send the same mail to 2,008 customers, but with APR at 2.5, uh, 31% responded, 1.11. Now, we send 3,000 customers uh, direct mail with APR of 3.5, we get 25%, which is 0 0.83. And then we send 2,000 customers, you know, with 4.5 as APR, 10 out of them responded, which is 0 0.50. Now, estimating total demand, we typically send the direct mail offers to 200,000 homes, or this one is supposed to be 20,000 homes. What is the expected number of new customers acquired for each price level? And remember, the price levels are there. You know, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5. Now, that's the estimated expected customers that we're going to get, which is the efficacy. That is the number of people that responded out of the total. You know, multiplied by the 20,000 homes that we sent the, in the direct mail to. So this is supposed to give you 35,000, you know, uh, 35,000 expected customers, 22,000, you know, 200 expected customers, and the rest. So we realize that the demand, you know, uh, demand curve is actually responding to price changes, which means, you know, uh, the demand is sensitive to price. Factors to keep in mind when estimating demand function. Now, measurement issues. The need to secure sufficient sample size to detect differences. So we make sure that the sample size that we're actually you know, uh, targeting with, uh, with the mail is significant enough so that we'll be able to do, a, do the, you know, arrive at a decision that yes, quite a lot of people will actually respond. Otherwise, we may not actually get the right gauge you know, groups need to be identical and comparable. So, again, we need to have uh, identical groups, you know. Uh, unmeasured effect, the impact of seasonality and timing. Of course, we have to actually understand at what point are we selling, are we sending that particular mail. We may send it at the you know, peak period. And once you send it at peak period, your, you know, we may be clouded by it because off-peak would have you know, different responses. Or, for example, I mean, if you have to send, you know, direct mail to about credit card to customers after Christmas, or even right before Christmas, you know that the off, I mean, the takeoff is going to be much more than when you actually send it, you know, mid-year. It will be different responses. So, example, try period for term life insurance policy built to the credit card introductory APR for new line of credit cards, loyalty programs, well, that's the promotional pricing for financial services, other financial services. And advantages may be highly relevant to consumers' needs, may trigger excitement for general and expecting product disadvantages, may only attract deal-prone prospects who may not exhibit long-term loyalty.
We also have to be mindful of the environment, you know, environmental trends in price and financial services. I mean, deregulation should lead to price competition, yet consolidation measures have not yet resulted in lower prices. Of course, the assumption is that when the industry is deregulated, obviously that increases competition. But when the competition actually happens, we expect the prices will actually, you know, reduce or, you know, the prices should be you know, affordable to customers. Yeah, we see consolidations, measures, you know, again, when companies merge and things like that, the assumption is that the ones that are not doing well are actually acquired and with the, with the scale that the company expects to, to work on, I mean, um, the, uh, what do you call, the size, if, if the customer base actually expands, you want to think that the average cost, you know, becomes, you know, lower, and as a result, customers actually get lower prices. But we have been made to understand that sometimes it doesn't happen because when companies become so huge, they have the bargaining power and they still keep prices at uh, high levels. Obviously, the internet is slowly facilitating price shopping and objective assessment of service provider ratings, post-purchase quality through consumer forums, and third-party ratings. So, internet is also having a big impact, you know, in you know, financial services pricing as it's influencing, you know, consumers' decisions, you know, on financial services. So, new technology like internet ATMs are driving down the cost and provide much higher levels of price flexibility. Offshore sourcing. Obviously, in the past, we've talked about how companies have actually outsourced you know, their customer services, for example, to other countries as a result, taking advantage of you know, uh, uh, what you call lower salaries or uh, cheap labor and you know, making sure that they can offer lower prices to consumers. Thank you. I think that's the end of the session. Uh, looking at you know, the various pricing strategies, looking at the various pricing objectives that we have in financial services. And throughout the session, we know that financial pricing and financial services, the only element that actually brings in the revenue, but it also alerts you know, the competition and you know, at the same time, you know, signal quality of service. And we've seen that before you set up your pricing, you have to actually have an objective towards it. Is the objective to actually beat competition? Is the objective to actually increase market share? Is the objective to actually increase profitability? You need to have your pricing strategy set right and the objective set right before you agree on any of the three pricing methods that we, we discussed, cost-based pricing, parity pricing, value-based pricing. Thank you.